mailing. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Hugh Devereaux Mack is the spokesperson for the Council of Licensed Firearms Owners and Deer Stalkers New Zealand. You may have heard him in other media getting machine gunned, excuse the pun, by hosts and interviewers. Well, that's not going to happen here. We're going to have a good long chat about firearms, firearms legislation, and we're going to bust some myths and hopefully educate you a little bit about firearms. With me now is Hugh Devereaux Mack from Colfo, and we're going to talk guns, aren't we? Absolutely. I think we're going to have a great discussion about a, a number of topics today. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm a, a firearms enthusiast. I'm a member of Antique Arms. We just recently had our gun fair in uh, arms fair in Auckland, had about 500 members of the public through. Um, there's clearly a strong interest in firearms. Um, a lot of those were family groups that were coming coming through. People were buying and selling firearms. But there's uh, been a whole lot of demonization, hasn't there, of firearms owners and guns in general, um, particularly since an Australian t- terrorist came to New Zealand and actually broke all the laws and the police failed all of the licensing requirements and somehow it's the firearms owners that have been punished. It's interesting because that's actually what brought me into the Council of Licensed Firearms Owners to begin with. I got sick of seeing our community put up and blamed for a police mishandling of the current laws. Like they completely failed to administer the laws of the time that would have kept us safer um, and denied uh, the terrorist a firearms license. And yet Somehow we were then being lumped into the same category as him, and I didn't feel that was right. Um, mm. So that's what brought me in. Like like you, I've been, I mean, I started rabbit shooting with my father when I was six, mm. um, graduated to shotguns and um, rifle shooting and hunting after that. Took a break through university because it's actually quite hard for young people moving around and flatting and everything to own guns. Um, but now live in Wellington, homeowner. And so I've got back into it, both working uh, with Colfo as a volunteer and uh, the New Zealand Deer Stalkers um, mm. in marketing. So I get to think about firearms and these issues full time, which is great, and help our community start rebuilding, I guess, our image that oh, successive governments following the uh, the terrorist attack really, really destroyed for us. Yeah, they talk about um, the need to make all of those changes and we needed to have a buyback, which actually was a confiscation, but uh, because of public safety, uh, because of one person, uh, I I hesitate to use the term running amok because it's not technically correct. I mean, if you know where the Mm -hmm. word amok comes from, but, but that's what the media use, so let's just keep using that. One guy broke the law and the punishment was not him being imprisoned. He was imprisoned. Uh, But the punishment was then meted out against every other shooter in New Zealand with the buyback and uh, very restrictive policies that saw a large number of firearms confiscated by the police and destroyed or theoretically destroyed. Mm. Yeah, the interesting thing there was, you're right, we were all punished for the acts of someone, for the acts of a terrorist. But what really concerned me was... After it all happened, like we didn't have a say. The law was rolled out within sort of seven days. It was announced. There wasn't proper thought. And I think firearms owners, we were all horrified by what happened. Obviously, it was the worst terror attack New Zealand has ever and probably will ever see. All go, like, But the fact that this law was just, it just felt too quick. And we should have waited until we'd actually seen the results of either a coroner's report or the Royal Inquisitor to say, yep, the law's that we want to change now based on emotion are actually going to reduce gun crime in future. What we've actually seen is criminals are still using firearms to do harm in our community and the gun crime rate seems to be rising. Every other weekend there's a new headline of a shooting or guns being found in the hands of criminals in main media. So we were promised the buyback, or rather the confiscation and compensation event. We were promised that the register would stop it. We haven't seen those results, so when are we going to change the approach and instead of punishing license owners, when are we going to go after the criminals more heavily? Yeah, well, that's allowing them to plead down on firearms cases. Yeah, I mean, that's what staggers me, right? If you poach fish 
and get caught by the fisheries officers on the boat ramp, you'll be prosecuted. The fines are tens of thousands of dollars. Your boat, your car, all your gear and everything associated with that event of fishing is confiscated, never to be returned. You commit a firearms offence and it gets pleaded down to almost nothing and probably they don't even spend time in jail these days. And I've had this argument with multiple police ministers over the to- over time, the current police minister, the former police minister and the police minister before that, and said that the, the, the penalties are, are not in keeping with the severity of offences. And we're all for, as shooters, we're all for penalties for people breaking the law because we have to jump through hoops. And if you're like me with a collector's licence and, and prohibited licences, there's a lot of hoops that you've got to jump hmm. through. The safe requirements alone uh, is a substantial investment. You know, if someone wants to steal my safe, they're going to need you know a crane and a truck and the ability to move two and a half tonnes by themselves. You know, it's just not going to happen. So we've got all these requirements on us, um, have had those requirements for a long time. And, you know, a little known secret is I helped actually draft the 1983 Arms Act oh. um, when, when Peter Hilt rewrote that. And um, and I was the one who came up with the idea of presenting a, a, a license to buy ammunition because I said at the time you didn't need a license to buy ammunition back then. And the Arms Act was actually quite a, a nice piece of legislation. Where it's fallen down from, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is what my perception is, is where it fell down is the police kept going to a compliant police minister and asking for regulations that were never promulgated into law. And so there's a whole vast array of regulations that no one knows about that aren't published anywhere that's easy to find, and then they go and snap people for those breaches of regulations. But in many cases, the regulations were nonsensical in the first place Mm. There's a, there's because a couple they were of dreamed points. up by a team of people in police national headquarters. Same problem. Yeah, there are a couple of points to pick up on there. One of the first ones is actually jumping back to the original, I guess, after the terrorist attack. The Mongol mob, actually, their spokesperson put out a thing where they were asked whether they would be complying in the confiscation event and whether the Mongol mob would put their firearms back uh, whether they'd be uh, they'd be giving their firearms back for compensation, and their spokesperson said that actually the New Zealand public needed to trust them that they would only use the firearms that they illegally held on each other or on uh, other activities directly required to their business, which to me was astounding because they were admitting they had illegal firearms, and they said no, we're not going to give them back, but we should trust them. Where the government was coming after licensed firearms owners who have no criminal record, are some of the best vetted people in New Zealand, have gone through the mental health checks and everything else, vetting, unlike Tarrant. And then we were not to be trusted, but they were, these criminals. Following on from that, um, a lot of the regulations and things that have come in post that have been punishments for having a firearms license. A lot of New Zealanders don't understand that if you want to, if police want to raid a, a gang house to go after drugs or anything else, they need a search warrant from a judge to approve that. If you're a licensed firearms owner, you give up that right. And for purely the act that you followed the law, you got the, you jumped through all of the hoops, you ticked all the boxes and you proved you were fit and proper, you have the privilege of allowing police to raid your home and search it without warrant and without warning based on rumor or let's say an ex-girlfriend. Uh, says they don't like you. Police are allowed to raid your home for that, seize your firearms and put you through an expensive court case. I don't see how that can be uh, deemed an appropriate thing that the rest of New Zealand should be happy with as a precedent. And I agree with you there. And having been the victim of of uh, one of those attempts, you know, in the US it's called swatting, where yes. your political opponents uh, lodge a complaint, an anonymous complaint to the police, say that you've got a firearm, or you're going to commit suicide, or you're, you're talking about that. Next minute, the police are charging through your door, and and uh, you know the political activists are hoping that that you'll do something that will end up you getting shot. Yeah, happened to Rachel Stewart, um, our political opponents. You know, I had two police officers arrive at my door, knock on the door, fully armed with Glocks, tasers, and you know vests. Mm-hmm. Uh, car parked out the front, and. Um, you know, they, they took a softly, softly approach, luckily with me. They came to the door and they said, um, you know, we're, we're here to inspect your safe. 
And I said, well, I've been here for four years and it's already been inspected. So have you got an appointment? And this is what I did is I insisted that they follow the law. Mm. And the law is, is that if you want, if they want to come and inspect, they have to give you a date and a time in a reasonable time. They can't say they want to come and inspect at five in the morning, but there they were on the doorstep, the police actually breaking the law, trying to get me to let them into the house. Mm-hmm. I insisted that they didn't have an, uh, an appointment. They didn't have a booking and they hadn't given me seven days notice as required by law so they could leave. And they argued for 20 minutes about their insisting on staying to check the safe. And I said, mm-hmm. well, no, you've said that that's your purpose of coming here. You don't have a warrant. You don't have any other reason to come here. So I'm insisting that you follow the law. And I sent them yep. on their way. But not many people do that. You know, I, I know shooters that have been stopped a kilometre down the road from a gun club, and the police have said, oh, well, you're just at the gun club, and we want to check how you're storing your firearm in your vehicle. And they let them check them storing the, vi- the firearm in the vehicle. But a vehicle is the same as a home. If they want to do mm. that inspection, they have to give you seven days' notice. But a lot of people think, oh, well, they're the police, I'll comply. But the police are actually breaking the law, and then if they catch you, then they prosecute you, even though they broke the law to get you there. I think one of the key things you've identified there is it's not just a, oh, we'll just let them because they're the police. There's the fear of repercussions. So how many times have licensed firearms owners uh, come onto the wrong side of police because an officer didn't like them? I had a case uh, a couple of days ago of a uh, an individual who came asking for help because his former partner had then checked up with a police officer took a dislike to him, and suddenly his license is being revoked and challenged, putting him through an expensive court case because he's just got on the wrong side. And so what this really comes down to is a systemic problem with how the system is currently set up or has been built over a number of years, Mm. where the police are currently the judge, jury, and executioner for everything around firearms. Now, there is a bit of a step of of progress separating and to, to Tidy Pureke, the TPP Firearm Safety Authority, they're still within police. So as that moves away to justice, the administration portion needs to step away from the, uh, the enforcement part of it. But we also then need a real clear justification of what does fit and proper actually mean? In my view, and in Colfo's view, that means unless you have a criminal conviction and that is passed down by a judge, then you are by default a fit and proper person. It Mm. shouldn't just be something police can arbitrarily remove because of an anonymous complaint on the internet or an officer just saying, you know what, I I, want to search your car because you've just been at the gun club. If you say no, then maybe you're not complying, maybe you're not fit and proper, and maybe this is going to lead to a court case. That's exactly what they do. They say that um, to your face. You know, like that's what the police said to me when they are at the front door, and I said, no, I insist you follow the law. They said, oh, come on, mate, it's not going to go well for you. And I said, was that a threat? Oh, no. Yeah. I said, oh, good answer for the video. You Which, know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because the Firearm Safety Authority recently put out their, their very selected survey that was uh, basically trust and confidence in police to administer the law as at an all-time high, and they made a big deal of it. We finished our own one of licensed firearms owners. Granted, we can't send it to every firearms owner like they could, they didn't in this chance. In this case, they sent it to people who had recently got their firearms license. So no one who's sort of experienced or been in the community for a while. I mean, if they really wanted to know how trust and confidence is going, they have everybody's emails, everybody's contacts, send it to all 243,000 of us and see what comes back. But we know they won't because even the Colfo one with a couple of thousand people on it uh, came back as the trust and confidence in police to administer the act without bias scored a massive 1.6 out of 10. <laughs> like, and that was January this year, taken from our 2023 results. Um, so unless they've done a drastic thing in the last six months, I don't think they've improved it to two-thirds of licensed firearms owners believe in them in seven months. But that's that's the spin now. And I understand where they're coming from. Um, they need to be seen to, to justify the fact that TTP being set up is – improving the confidence and building these relationships. And there is a potential for that to happen, but it's not going to happen in seven months. It's also probably not going to happen until they're outside of police's control and able to rebuild the 
relationships we used to have with our arms officers prior to 2019. Like the fact that they turn up to our houses, they can look at our criminal records, see that we have no record, no violence, nothing. We pay our taxes, we're law abiding, but they feel that they need to turn up with glocks on their hips. Mm. Any citizen being confronted with armed police at your door, regardless of time, day, or even if you haven't done anything, it's a quite an intimidating thing. I mean, we're around firearms a lot, Mm. but we've never been on the receiving end of one of those when you know that the person has or could have ill intent towards you and they are fearful. Like you see it happening in the States, which is why Colfo first spoke out saying armed police should not be the default New Zealand. I don't think we're at that point. I think it's a terrible idea. Mm. But being on the receiving end of armed police is mentally quite fragile, like quite uh, shaking. Mm. There's a there's a whole different side we can get into about the mental health around firearms owners and why we're no longer reporting or asking for help. But the other side is the constabulary turning up to your door, maybe at your workplace or in front of your neighbors. It's just an embarrassing thing to happen and makes you feel like a criminal, even when you've done nothing wrong except obey the law. And that has changed the fundamental community policing model to shit firearms owners are more fearful of the police and less likely to ask for help which is not what we want no, we have a problem the guys in my club we, we all used to be g-men right we we thought the police were on our side that we'd assist the police and then post 2019 there's almost nobody in the club that will go out of their way to assist the police in any, in any way or regard and you know, yeah. before the before the register came in, we had a visit at our we're the largest club in in New Zealand, being in Auckland. We had a pretty full turnout um, at a meeting where Mike McElwraith came to talk to, uh, and he had a, a lot of his offsiders came to talk to us about the 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 register that was then coming in. And um, he said, "Oh, well, we're engaging with the with the community," and everyone said, "We well, haven't talked to us," you know. You know and then then proceeded to lecture us about how bad we all were and uh, and how this was going to solve a lot of problems. And then when the questions started coming about how the register was going to operate, we quickly realised how little thinking had gone into the register. And I'll give you an example, right? So um, somebody asked, well, what do you do with firearms that don't have a serial number? And, and you might think that all firearms have serial numbers, but serialization of Firearms mm. didn't start happening until industrialization, which is post 1900, right? Yep. So we asked this question, and Mike McElroy said, Oh, all firearms have got serial numbers. And we said, and mm-hmm. everyone just laughed at him. And then we, then we said, Well, now what if you've got a firearm that doesn't have a serial number? He says, Oh, well, that's easy then. Um, this is what I'll, I'll put an instruction out that you're to use the largest number that's on the side of, of a firearm. And we all just laughed. And me, who's a Martini Henry collector, yeah. cracked up laughing, right? Because, and, and I've gone through the process of re- going to the register, and we'll talk about the register in a minute, but mm. I've, got, I've now registered 10 Martini Henrys. Five of them have the same serial number, which is 1887, because the mm. largest number on the side of the receiver is the year, yeah. is the year it was made, <laughs> right? And, um, and then I said, well, what, what do I do with um, this Gehendra rifle? He says, what's that? I said, what? It's a rifle that was made in Nepal. Well, you use the serial number they put on it. They were handmade. There's no serial numbers on it. Any numbers that are on it are in Dev- Devangari. How do I do that? And, yep. and no answer. And, mm. and then if you, you, you interact with the um, with the register because you have to because of, you know, you're buying or selling or whatever, you go in to register something. I registered my, my Vickers machine gun, for example, and it said to me, uh, and I went to the pick, pick down list. Oh, yes, Vickers machine gun. Here it is. Caliber, yes, eight millimeter. Mine's an eight millimeter Mauser. Mm-hmm. And then it said, uh, How many rounds in the detachable box magazine? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a belt fed machine gun. Yep. <laughs> right. I've, had, I've had other people have very similar. An interesting one we found is there seems to be a, I mean, obviously, not everyone that could be hired by TTP has to be a firearms expert, not everyone can be. But we had someone literally two hours before this conversation contact us because they were having problems with the individual who was trying to help them through the phone line. A, having an online system for a group of people who are older and not necessarily the most tech savvy. Even signing up for a Realme account is quite challenging for some of them. I'm tech savvy and I had trouble registering things yep. online. 
<laughs> then there's the oh, in order to sign up for a Realme account, you need to uh, get a text message to your phone when people are in areas that don't have any cell phone reception. So yeah. I've had stories of people having to drive down the road to get the number, then driving back in time for the before the timeout happened. Yeah. So there's ridiculous things like that. But then the phone solution was presumably quite a good one to sort of mitigate the the older people. So fine. But the woman on the phone was asking like, oh. Uh, is the uh, is a revolver got a detachable magazine? How many how many rounds does a six shot revolver uh, hold? I'm like, I mean, that's in the that's in the title of the <laughs> of the thing, and so I think it's understandable that the the confidence in those administering the system is relatively low. Um, but likewise, the belt fed box magazines, all the rest of it, Peak View Range has done a few sort of TikTok videos and things on there rather funny experiences with dealing TTP. But yeah, it's it's just a, a fascinating situation where we have some of the basic level of knowledge is missing from the people that are supposed to be keeping us safe. And I don't see experts being hired into their either their policy team um or their administration. But but it's you know the register was supposed to be easy, easy to yeah. use, right? It's not easy. For example, I, I've I've moved house and had a marriage split up. And that's always difficult with firearms because there's so many things that can go wrong there. So what I did is I moved my firearms, uh, all the pistols onto one person's license and everything else I've moved into another guy's strong Mm -hmm. room. So we did all the paperwork for the pistols and supplied a list, you know, of all of the pistols that I had uh, to, to the police who then transposed everything and then spent 40 minutes on the phone with me saying, well, you haven't got a, um, uh, you haven't got this one. That's not on your license. Uh, well, well, actually, it is, but it, the serial number is this, not that. Mm. And so we'd actually provided them with with an Excel spreadsheet that they could have imported, and it was just a d- debacle from the beginning to the end. And so, what should have been a, an easy transfer from one license to the next license, because of the intervention of the person at at, at um, the Tari Pukiko, which is what I call it, mm. you know. Um, turned into a mess and it was a prolonged progress and then even then I still had to go in to the thing and then transfer those to the other person's license and that's the bit that's getting missed out that people are are selling a gun there the person who's buying it goes and registers it but it's still on your license because you haven't gone and transferred it to the other person's license Mm. and it's just it's turned into like I'd say the data in that database now is a mess. Or I mean, you're, you're not wrong in that. So uh, having looked at their recent, they just announced that the first anniversary of the, the firearms registry has has passed. They said 220,000 firearms have been registered by more than 46,000 license holders. So that's 20%. I'm like, okay. So that's 20% of people. A, clearly shows how few of us are, well, I mean, the firearm, the firearm sales. Here. Yeah, we're doing everything we can not to trigger the register. I know yep. firearm safety sales are down. Uh, firearm sales are down. Talking to uh, dealers and importers, first off. Um, so, a we don't want to register. But then the other one is the fact that we're having these problems, like you've just outlined, at only twenty percent of us. What's it going to be like in say five years' time when you have 90 percent of us registered? However many firearms. Um, the fact that we say there's there's millions of firearms in the country. They were surprised to hear they were like, yeah, that's, it's probably like maybe two, three million firearms. They were just surprised that it could be anywhere near that many. I'm like, well, average person, like regular hunter shooter, three or four is pretty typical. Yeah. Um, 22 or 17 HMR, uh, uh, 308. Um, a shot- couple of shotguns, pump action over and under. Yep. Like, and there's, there's, there's four, four right there. Right? Yeah. And that's let alone if you have five. You know, maybe you like, have a tar hunting long range rifle, maybe you have a 308, like a, um, yeah, a bush gun of some sort, lever action. Yeah. Yep. And then just the, a couple of fun plinkers, let alone if you're into, uh, well, what used to be three gun. I don't know what they're doing now that the, the E cats have been removed. Um, but pistol shooting on top of that, um, as well as the parts, that register is going to be an absolute mess, which is why Canada scrapped their one in the end. The magazines. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, a metal box with a spring in it now has to be registered, for those who don't know, right? Mm. 
So I've got rifles that have got magazines because you know, they're M16s or, or SLRs or whatever, and every one of those magazines has to be registered. And what yeah. people are doing, because they don't have – this is the other thing we said, well, hang on, we've got collector's items, and you're wanting us to put serial numbers on them, destroying yeah. the value. And the police didn't care. No. They just don't care. But but go, let's go back to that conversation, right? We, we talked about some numbers, you know, the numbers you're talking about, two or three million firearms. Yeah. How many guns did the police say he got handed back? I can't remember the actual number. Um, it was a thousand, wasn't it? Yeah, like I mean, if you, even if you look at the funny thing is they should know exactly how many firearms they were expecting because they had a firearms register prior to 2019 for ECAT firearms as well as pistols. And so when you look at how accurate the the pistol ECAT database was ECAT and the ECATs were in the register as well, remember. Yep. So all of those, they should have known exactly how many firearms they were coming back. So they should have been able to say, you know what? We got 100% of all of these firearms that were legally held by people. If they had done that, I'm, I'm sure we would have seen the headlines celebrating it. The fact that we didn't see celebrations of that or even being highlighted to me suggests that actually there were more out there than they possibly knew or had accurate records of. And who knows where those guns have ended up now? But here's the thing, right? I know a few gun dealers. And under the old act, every firearm that was imported in New Zealand had to be imported with a permit, mm. right? So if you're bringing in, for example, um, a container of SKS rifles, and container fulls of SKS rifles were yep. imported to New Zealand, right? They were very common back in the, um, in the 80s and 90s. You could buy an SKS rifle um, for about $400, uh, and and a box of ammunition, ten thousand rounds for you know, about the same. Yep. And I know that there were many containers that were brought in on those, and I know approximately how many SKS rifles there are in a container. Mm -hmm. Well, there weren't that many SKS rifles handed in. Yep. Where are they? <laughs> in, um, in, in the in the thing, I know that. I, I know uh, that for sure. They weren't handed yeah. in. So where and are we they? know? And the other interesting one there is they said that they never had a, they never had a register or they didn't know how many firearms were coming into the country. Every firearm, as you say, has an import permit that needs to, the, the funny one was I called them out on this and said that, look, you know how many firearms came in because in order to import a firearm, you had to tell police exactly what you're importing. And then they said, oh, we, we don't have the serial number for those because it isn't required on the import permit. And the answer is like, technically, they were correct. It isn't because you don't know the serial numbers until they arrive on the ground. You mm -hmm. then had to provide the serial numbers once you received the firearms within, I think it was a month. And so it's like, yeah, technically you've dodged the question to say we never had the serial numbers. Actually, you did have the serial numbers. It was a month later and then strapped on or bolted onto the national security database system. But there was no uh, legal requirement to keep a track of those. Therefore, it wasn't an accurate database. So they needed the new register to fix this. I'm like, well, if you had a database that was working, granted your people weren't following the law, which, I mean, we've never seen that happen before, shooting back to the Christchurch conversation. So you had a database, you had the serial numbers, and yet you're not being able to track these when they're in criminal hands. They even said, I think it was 86% of firearms seized, oh, 82% of criminal weapons. They didn't know the source of them. I'm like, right. So what is a register really going to help with this? if you already had one and you well, just this, didn't execute it properly. This is the point I raised with Mike McElraith. I said to him, you're saying that the register and, and the gun control people as well, you know, Hera Cook and, and um, Philip Alpers, mm. pipe up every now and then, yes, we need to have a gun register because they're registered everywhere else in the world. And go, yeah, okay, sure. What about Canada? And we won't talk about Canada. No, no, Canada you can't mention Canada. It's been two billion, $2 billion. $2 billion. $2 billion and cancelled it because it doesn't work. Australia's yeah. register is a complete debacle. Yes. Um, it never worked anywhere in the world because it requires humans to input input things and humans are fallible. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got the situation where you, don't, you, had, you didn't know what you were starting with in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you might say, they say, oh, we've got 225,000 firearms registered in the register now. And I'm sitting there thinking, hang on a second. I know five people in my club that have got probably between them 5% of that number. Mm -hmm. The more. big collectors will be some of those early ones, like people who own hundreds of firearms. Yep. 
Yep. I mean, I don't envy them the paperwork they had to do for this as on their own personal time, let alone the changes and any hand mistakes. But you're right. Like the the register would never be completely accurate because it relies on humans. But skipping apart the accuracy and the logistics, let's say we had a perfect system of firearms of every legal firearm that was imported every time it was traded between licensed owners. That doesn't stop the criminals who, A, before the firearms register came into place, after it was announced, police reported an increase in the number of firearms they were seizing from criminal hands that had the serial number removed. Therefore, before the register was even there, everyone was like, oh, well, screw this. We'll just remove the numbers and that'll protect us a little bit. The other side was it was a recent piece that was written around the number of containers that were scanned at ports. And it was around 7% of all shipping containers coming into the country were actually searched or scanned. 7% is not a lot, let alone the number of debanding sites around the site, around the country where they can be opened, farms, everything else. They say, oh, straw buyers are the number one identifiable source. Might, yep, I mean, well, and, they've only, and they've only given us three examples, right? Yeah. So, and I mean, to be fair, those three terrible people should not have been given firearms licenses in the first place. Punish stupid. them, lock them up. Great. But, they, but then those three were not caught because of a register. No. Right? They weren't caught because of a register. Let's, let's, no. let's, let's need to understand that. The register didn't catch those straw buyers. Those straw buyers were stupid. Yep. They went and bought 20 firearms of the same kind by themselves. They drew attention to themselves. It wasn't mm-hmm. caught because they were registered. And, yep. and, then, and then when the police went and, and followed it up, they then discovered that some of them had been distributed around the place and some had turned up in crimes. But you're right. You can have a serial number, and, and the police always say, oh, well, that we not want, need to know where it came from. Well, you can have guns stolen. And I can tell you right now, if a, if a gang member came into my house and held a gun to my head and said, open the safe. Yeah, here you go. Thank you. I'd open the safe and I'd ask him if he needed help loading it in the van. Yeah. And Don't this is a guy for a criminal. This is one thing that gun control New Zealand and uh, the sort of anti gun mob have not really understood when they hear, why are you so opposed to registering your firearms? And it's because when we say, oh, it puts us at risk, they never really ask how. And the answer is previously, Criminals could know, okay, we know our address and we know that this person owns guns because they're probably not that shy about it. They might have a few Facebook posts or whatever else. And that's if their OPSEC, uh, their operation security is bad. If they're keeping themselves to themselves, then let's say the list of firearms owners is compromised, ends up in criminal hands. They can look at about, okay, it's Joe happened. Bloggs, Joe Bloggs lives here. He has a gun license. We don't know what he has. I don't know if it's worth it. But now with the new register, when that is compromised, and we've seen data comp breaches from police even after the confiscation event with lists of licensed firearms owners' details being found in the home of a criminal who knew enough to keep that list. Mm. Luckily, it was only Auckland addresses and names and didn't have the details yet. Next time, it'll have the details and they'll say, you know what, these three houses are rural and they have 10, 15, 20 firearms. I might go there armed myself because why would I turn up to a gun owner's home unarmed Mm. and if they have family members if they have children if they say look gives you guns unlock your safe show us where it is or i'm going to hurt your wife i'm going to hurt your children or you you're right we're going to say we're really sorry about this here it is take it away go for it please don't hurt our families because that matters more to us and it's just for whatever reason because these individuals don't have something like that on the line or or could risk it they seem to have empathy for every other group being safe and feeling secure. But when given a real problem for our community, that empathy is gone. Nothing. It's like, well, we need to feel safe. I might, the, but at what default, cost? The default uh, demeanor from police towards firearms owners now is that you're a, a potential criminal mm-hmm. and we're, we're just waiting for you to make a mistake and we're going to catch you and we're going to do you over. Completely that, right. That's how most shooters that I talk to feel towards the and, police. And it wasn't just shooters that backed that up. In the law review, the law society came forward and spoke out against the changes, saying that it was a reversal of the innocent until proven guilty principle. So mm-hmm. for the first time, licensed firearms owners were treated as guilty and then needing to prove that we were innocent. All licensed firearms owners have felt that since 2019. 
And the, the interesting thing is, if that attitude were to continue, and if we were to see more restrictions placed on licensed firearms owners, higher costs for licensing, further restrictions, restrictions on what we can buy, but not seeing the same level of punishment for firearms crime, how many people are going to say, you know what, I'm going to opt out of the licensing system. I've got my guns already. I'll be unlicensed. That's not a situation that any New Zealander should be comfortable with. It's not one that licensed firearms owners are comfortable with. But if they continue pushing this line of further restrictions on us, I can imagine more people are going to end up going down that path. And I'd say most of those would be in the rural areas. Yep. Right? Yeah, it's just... too hard. It's too hard to interact with with the police and register and all the rest of it. It's just too hard. So no, no, no police ever come out here anyway. Even if we have a, a burglary or rustling or um, it's something you know untoward happening, we sort it out ourselves because the police are two hours away. I think I heard, um, oh, we, we deal with a lot of uh, issues with poaching in the South Island um, of deer and everything else. I believe it was something like two police or two rural police officers to cover a large patch of South, uh, North and South Canterbury. So they basically believe that if an incident happens there, there's two officers, no one's going to police it, no one's going to follow up, no one cares. And so, yeah, you're right. Like, how are you going to stop good old boy, good old girl who just has the rifle for pig hunting or deer hunting, whatever else, just owning it, keeping quietly to themselves right now, bulk buying some ammo before it's on the registration process or getting ammo elsewhere afterwards? We lose... The approach of we need to restrict licensed firearms owners further is going to lead to people saying, I'm just opting out of the licensing process. Mm. And that's not a good, it's not a good outcome. And we but, want to avoid it. It's, it's like, you know, the, the whole register process that we went through, they, they talked about, oh, we've educated people, we've done this, we've done that. And yet every day there's incidents of, of firearms that are coming and handed into gun shops or magazines being discovered down the back of a safe or something like that. And then, you know, I I actually know of several cases where the gun shop owners have gone to register the the magazines, right? And they might be rare magazines. Mm. They could be, uh, you know, they could be M16 magazines or SLR magazines. They're worth about 300 bucks. Um, ironically, they've gone up because of the register um, mm -hmm. value. So it's worthwhile registering them. And the police are intransigent. They don't have a process for anything that should have been registered by, before the deadline that now it is turning up. And, and it happens all the time. People do alterations to houses and they rip out the walls and go, oh, hello, there's a firearm here. Because people, like, I, I know of a collectible Mauser rifle, very rare, that was found inside a wall in a, in a house mm -hmm. um, down country. And, uh, and, and that was then, that was before the register came in. But now, the police would say, well, that should have been handed back. So no, sorry, you can't. Yep. You know, and, and then they're destroying a, a, an antique firearm that's got historical value. Same with the magazine, same with all sorts of stuff. It, it, so how do we fix this? Um, you know, mm. the, the act seemed pretty good until it's had all of these regulations piled on top. You know, I mean, they had. I mean, it's crazy when they brought in the military-style semi-automatics or E-category firearms in the old parlance. Mm -hmm. That was crazy too. If something had a pistol group, and now it was a military-style semi-automatic semi rifle, it was just insane. These things, right? How do we fix this? Do we do we amend the existing arms act? Do we do, mm. or do we do what Act is suggesting and do a rewrite from the ground up? I think the best thing we can do is. When legislation gets so unclear and so bloated that it's no longer keeping New Zealand safe, which is what we've seen with the current Arms Act, with all the changes that you've outlined and many more that we could talk for days on, I think it's time that we need to start from the ground up and build a modern Arms Act that takes into account all of the firearms that are available today, the technology that is available to support police and licensed firearms owners uh, to keep New Zealand safe and build one that will last the next 50 years, for example. I was a big believer that New Zealand, even prior to 2019, had the best firearms laws in the world from a perspective of balancing public safety with the right to access firearms for hunting, sport, and collecting. 
Mm. We're, we're so far past that now. The, the Labour government rushed legislation through. They took in bans and they've just they just scrapped good lawmaking based on an emotional um, result. And at this point, starting from scratch is probably a better uh, way to go about it. How we start that process, I think it's important that, as uh, Minister McKee has said, we need to make sure that everyone is at the table and involved in the discussions, not just the licensed community who are affected directly, but regular New Zealanders as well, because they need to feel protected and comfortable with people owning firearms. We use them for everything from, I mean, the number of people who are looking into learning how to hunt because of the cost of living crisis is skyrocketing right now. Yeah. Like, and let alone the Department of Conservation needs hunters to control the out of control pest numbers um, yeah. of browsing species, although we don't consider them pests. I'm using their terminology for this. Yeah, um, the Department of Conservation considers humans to be pests. Anything that's not native to New Zealand, mate, it's got to go. Yep. But from our perspective, starting from scratch is a good one and making sure that if we're allowing everyone at the table, all ideas are brought forward and considered. So even the ideas of bringing back uh, the E-category firearms, for example, with special license, like a graded license. Well, um, well, that's what I said at the time to Stuart Nash. And I said, you know, this is an easy problem to solve. You know, you're, you're trying to, to crack a nut with a sledgehammer here hmm. and it's not going to work. Why don't you just make all semi-automatic A-category firearms E-category and make everybody go through a vetting process to upgrade their security, and that would solve 99% of what you're trying to, trying to do. But they just yep. reject that out of hand. And, and yep. as we've already pointed out, they got X number, X tens of thousands of rifles back, but we know that hundreds of thousands of those rifles were sold. Mm. So it, it didn't work. I mean, this is the problem I have a, a lot in politics, is mostly you're dealing with stupid people. And, and it sounds crude, but the police are stupid and they come up with stupid solutions to non-problems. A, a good case is the regulations they brought in for transporting firearms and vehicles because yeah. somebody might steal one when you stopped at McDonald's and steal your gun out of your car. Well, yeah. Nobody ever stopped to say to the police, well, what are the statistics on that? Yeah, How many just guns- please provide evidence. Yeah, how many guns have been stolen from cars, Ex- except from police cars? Let's list. Ex- <laughs> yeah, because that's a lot. Because that's a lot, right? Take that out. How many? The mm-hmm. answer is almost none. Yep. Right. Another one was. Um, die on the roads from, from the road toll, right? Perfect example of this was the Section 6, which has been in the news. So Section 6 uh, is about the regulations that clubs and rangers have to follow. Yep. Now, they said that. I mean, our opponents, now that that's looking to be rev- like lifted and changed and altered to allow more shooting ranges around the country, the opponents of this say, oh, it's going to make New Zealand exponentially more dangerous because they're less regulated. When you look at the injury numbers, they'd had, not, I think it was the last 20 or 30 years, they'd had 19 injuries on ranges in total. About four of them were at long arm, so rifle ranges, which are still affected by the six and six changes. But 15 of those 19 injuries were at highly regulated pistol clubs that were vetted before the change by police. Mm. So, I mean, if you really wanted to think about it, you could say that you're most in danger while at a range if you're on a certified range. You'd be safer off at an uncertified one looking at the stats. Mm. But, you know, they, they what wanted was, to what were the injuries? How many of those injuries were gunshot wounds? Uh, there were a couple of them, but a lot of them <laughs> were... Point. Sprained ankles <laughs> I think a few of them were actually police or military injuries during their own training events. Yeah. Um, so that should be left out of the recreational one entirely. Um, Colfo put out a really good release on this on our website, which was correcting the claims that were made about clubs and rangers. Um, so if anyone's interested in sort of diving into those details, they're available easily. But that's the thing with police statements, isn't it? They come out with these things to justify an action. Right, we're going to clamp down on. We need a register to stop straw buyers. Oh, how many straw buyers have, have there been? Oh, three. three. There were three recently. Yeah. Not, I mean, although the amount of media coverage of those would make you think there's one every weekend. Oh, they're recycling the same stories. Yeah. Because yeah. because what happens? They do they do the story when they're arrested. They yep. do the story then when they're when they're in front court. of jail. Yeah. And yeah, and then they do it when they're sentenced. So they get three hits out of it, and it makes it sound like this is a terrible thing. And, and Carhill's big on the straw buyers, but it's a small number of people and they're criminals anyway. 
Yeah, because they're breaking what, the rule. Yeah, and what stops them is not the register or it's any of the, the clubs and ranges changes or increased fees. What stops them is good police work. And that's the only thing that has ever actually stopped criminals from doing harm, catching them and preventing it. And so instead of focusing on license owners, I don't see, especially when the government is really big on cutting costs across government departments, this seems to be the most obvious place to start. Um, so hopefully the National Party can see some sense in this and actually think... I wouldn't rush it, Matt. <laughs> it's just quietly. I'm young enough to still be optimistic. However, the longer I play Here's in the, the firearm problem. space, the less optimistic I become. Here's the problem, Hugh. The, f- the, the police minister is an ex-policeman. Yes. There, there's your problem right there. Now, what do, you, what do you say to people? I get this all the time, you know. Firearms owning ownership is a right is not a right, it's a privilege. Mm. Say to people about that. Yep. So my answer there is it is a responsibility. It's not a right or a privilege. When it comes down to owning a license, it's not given to absolutely anybody. A right would be, you know, the right to free speech can be owned by like can yeah, be we- practiced by criminals if you're on. Like we, we understand fundamentally what that is. United states, right? They, they yep. do have a right to bear arms, and in, in, yep. in, in their constitution, we don't. No. Nope. So in New Zealand, we don't have a right to bear arms, but we do have a responsibility if you are fit and proper. So if you're a law-abiding person that pays their taxes, that has no mental health consider like no serious mental health concerns, which again we'll get to shortly, um, then you should have access to a firearm until a court says you've been convicted of a crime and you're no longer fit and proper. So for basically any New Zealander, regardless of age, race, uh, political beliefs, religious beliefs, if you obey the law and you've never been convicted, then you have the ability to own firearms, to hunt, feed your family, whatever else it is. That's our perspective. The police are going along with people who have had a drink driving conviction, maybe Mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And yep. going, oh, we're revisiting this. And we don't think you should have your firearms. Correct. And the fault position is the police take everything and make you argue in a court of law, which will usually cost you more tens. money than most people have to actually defend it. Yeah. Um, so again, like the let's say the drunk driving one is uh, one that we we often hear because you're right. In the past, I think that unless the crime is directly related to something that is endangering others intentionally, so let's say domestic violence, absolutely, like no way yep. cut it out, so long as it's gone through a court and it's been proven that isn't just a, an allegation without without actual cause. Um, yeah, violent crimes, no firearms license for you. Sorry, you made your call. Um, but when it comes to, let's say you're a, a teenager or you got drunk when you were 21 and stepped behind the wheel and were caught, what relation does, or speeding is another one. Let's mm. say you've, you've racked up a few speeding fines. Does that mean you're no longer fit and proper to own a firearm? There's no correlation or linkage there to a firearm crime. Now, disclaimer, if you have been hunting, you get drunk while hunting and the guns are in the car when you're arrested for drunk driving. Different game, right? Because the firearm is directly firearm involved speed. in that situation. Absolutely. That would be justifiable. But if there's no link to firearms in the conviction or in the arrest, there shouldn't be a justification there for removing or revoking a firearms license. But the default position with the, of the police is that you're just a criminal looking for somewhere to happen and we're going to catch you and we're just going to stamp on top of you and treat you like scum because that's and, our default position. And because you are a licensed firearms owner, you are more likely to, I believe, be more heavily punished made into a headline and made an example of, rather than if you were an unlicensed person going through that, you'd probably be able to plead it down. Yeah. Uh, which is just kind of outrageous as a thought. Like but the idea should be outrageous to everyone. There's so many things that are wrong currently. I mean, I, I recently had a, a a relicensing, you know, in my license it expired, it's time to relicense. Went through the process. Guy came out to do the inspection and, and interview and the very long and lengthy three-hour process that it takes. And at the start of that, he handed me this questionnaire. He said, I'll fill that out. Um, I said, what's that? He said, oh, I just want to see what your knowledge of the arms act is. One of the questions in that, in that piece of paper was, before you put your firearm away after you finish shooting, what's the first thing that you should do? And then it had A, B, C, D, E, and E. Mm-hmm of the above and i chose c which was ensure the firearm is unloaded 
Yep. That's what I'd choose as well. Yep. And he said, no, you got that wrong. Um, you need to redo this. I said, why did I get it wrong? He says, because oh, we want E to be the answer, which is all of the above. I said, it's E isn't a single action. <laughs> what's the first says, what's the first thing that you do? Right. So your comprehension is not not up to speed. So I'm sorry, mm. I'm not expecting that. And then when he came in and inspected my safe, he looked in there and he said, and I, and I had four or five shotguns there. You know, I've got a a, uh, a trap gun and uh, a sporting plays gun and a whole lot of different shotguns. And he says, oh, that's not good. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, well, this guidebook that I've got here says that you have to have the forestock of the shotgun taken off. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll, this, I'll, have a deal, I'll make a deal with you. If you can show me in the law where it says that, mm. I'll take the forestock off the shotgun. If you can't show me in the law where it says that, I'll leave it on. He goes, it's in our guidebook. I said, is it in the law? It's in our guidebook. I said, I don't care if it's in your guidebook. No. Right? That your means guidebook, your guidebook is wrong. <laughs> your guidebook's wrong, right? And, and he says, oh, well, you know, you're being stroppy. And I said, mm, sounds like you're threatening me now. Yeah, careful, Cam. You're, if you're being stroppy with the arms officer, you might find yourself no longer fit and proper. No, I've got a, I've got a different approach than most people. Is I, I'm loud and, and vocal about my interactions with the police so that they don't take diabolical liberties with me. Mm. I think uh, one of the diabolical things we heard was, Oh, it's one of those nightmare ones where an older guy, he was accused of being fit and improper. They turned up to his house and seized all his firearms. He was an old, like an older guy. Yeah. They were caught mocking his disability on his internal CCTV cameras. Oh, yes. um, yeah. Yeah. And like horrendous story. And then guy later died of a heart attack while he was in the process of appealing the license. Yeah. And then the police finally came back and gave the family the guns back and actually <laughs> The, the funny one we hear a lot is when police find out that they were wrong in seizing a license or anything and give the guns back, they don't say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. They say, don't do it again. Yeah. Which is an outrageous thing because you're giving them back because we were never guilty in the first place, but you're still saying as though we were and you just couldn't prove it on this occasion, we'll get you next time. I've been involved in a number of court cases um, uh, defending against police action, confiscating firearms. And in, all, in every one of those uh, occurrences, the police manufactured evidence. Mm. They broke the law. And in one case, the judge actually said, well, where's this firearm? You've shown us photographs of it. I want to see for myself. Because a friend of mine gave uh, expert evidence that said that, that this was a Kia gun and not a sawn-off shotgun. Mm. And, and he said because it would have a – it has a bead sight on the front of it. And uh, and explained you know why and as a as somebody involved in antique arms that what a key gun was and all of that sort of thing, the judge said, "Well, I'd like to see this firearm," and the police couldn't produce it. Mm. They could not produce something that they had confiscated. It was gone. Uh, that's not uncommon. I remember there was a headline after the confiscation event of someone walking into a police station and walking out with a number of firearms, like yeah. robbed from the police station. Oh, so it happened down in uh, Palmerston North. Yeah. Walked so when it comes police station and walked out with fifteen firearms. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, handling police, I think, yeah, well, they they used to be seen as friends of the community, and we ask them for help. Unfortunately, through a, a number of reasons we've talked to um, today, now licensed firearms owners approach police with caution and as though they are going to be treated as criminals. So it's not uncommon to. Uh, want to record any interactions on your own cell phone, things like that. Internal yep. cameras around wherever you keep your firearms is not also not a bad idea if you can afford it. But it's just making sure that you're you're protected in the same way that they are, as well as keeping your own record of your firearms. Like if they confiscate them from you and you haven't registered yet because you're not required to, making sure you keep a photo of each one of them, tracking your own serial numbers so that if one of them was to go missing, they can't claim that it wasn't it wasn't there. Yeah. Or if they end up scratched or damaged, because exactly. yeah, they're not exactly the most. A couple of questions for you. There it might be a bit yeah. of a call here, but um, I've got there's a number of people in our club that aren't registering because they believe that uh, the register will cease to exist. Yeah. All right. What's your view on that? Yeah, it's the it's the million dollar. Well, technically, I think the seven million dollar question at this point. Starting with the easy one. Two hundred. I don't. 200 million yeah uh yeah it's like eight million dollars a year for the 
mm. for the, the administration, which is how many police on the street? Side note. When it comes to the easy, the easiest one is the pistol register, always going to be here. And I think probably rightly so. There's a fewer number of them. They're slightly I mean, more dangerous as a relative term, but people are less comfortable with pistols. So that one so will still be there. Same with collectors. Correct. Yeah. So pistols, collectors are probably still there. If E-category firearms or semi-automatic centerfires come back in, I'd expect those ones to be registered as well um, yep. under the higher restrictions. So the big question is A-category firearms. Um, that is everyone's uh, hunting rifles, sporting shotguns, those and the like. My gut feel is that the National Party, given that they have a police minister, are pretty desperate to see that one stay. The ACT Party are pretty comfortable with it being removed so long as the evidence that's provided when the law changes come around as part of the new Arms Act rewrite, if the evidence stacks up for removing it, then I believe it will be removed. Now, from our perspective, there's no question the evidence will stack up that it doesn't make sense because it hasn't anywhere in the world and it won't magically just work for New Zealand because of some unknown reason or because gun control New Zealand think it'll work. Mm -hmm. So that being said, Changing the law takes a long time. Uh, I believe ACT want to get it done in one term of government. So yeah. the Arms Act rewrite, it's been on the cards for a while. I know Nicole has been putting in work to consult with experts, although she's, it's funny, um, recently they were accused of being non-transparent because they went out to only a select number of people for um, reviewing the Section 6 Arms Act. Mm. What was neglected by Cahill at the police union as well as Gun Control New Zealand, was that that was not even the public consultation process. That was the pre-paper before they yeah. put anything together to yeah. make sure it was an expert piece. I'm like, so we're actually being more transparent than previous governments ever were, and yet they're being accused of being anti-transparent because one of the things I believe from GCNZ's perspective is when you have a government that is actually committed to listening to the evidence and being experts before setting law, and they haven't just got a compliant people who will go along with whatever the trend is, gun control New Zealand suddenly feel that they're being objectified or they're not being listened to. And my answer then was like, well, welcome to being a licensed firearms owner for the last like five, six years. Like now you know why we were complaining, but you told us to shut up and take it. So in this case, we're not even telling them to shut up. We're saying, you know what? Contribute, be an equal part of society and have just as much say, despite the fact their membership I think is less than 100 people. It might even be in the 30s. So why they have so much control in so many people's ear is ridiculous. Yeah. It's um, it's news by press release. Yeah. You know, your view is similar to mine. Right? I, I believe that a gun, gun register will exist, particularly for pistols, uh, restricted firearms, uh, collectors, uh, and prohibited firearms. And mm -hmm. maybe it'll be extended to E-category so that people who belong to pistol clubs can uh, compete in competitions. But yeah. that, that'll be it. Now, here's a really curly one. I saw this uh, on the weekend. Uh, a guy who was trying to buy a firearm, and um, he was asked for his firearms license. And he said, I don't have my firearms license on me, but I have a photograph of it on my phone. Will, mm. you, will you accept that? Now, yep. I, know, I know what my feeling is on that. that that's No. Yep, my my feeling is exactly the same as yours. I wouldn't be allowed to enter or leave the country with a photo of my passport, so Correct. or even purchase alcohol with a photo of my license. So yep. produce their physical card, or sorry, don't buy the gun now. Go home, get it, and come back. Yep, and that's where we why as shooters, when we see something, we need to say something. If someone's yep. being stupid, we need to a tell them they're being stupid, and then tell somebody else. Yes. Yeah, because it is, I mean, part of the, the reason joining uh, shooting clubs and being part of the community is important is because we can do exactly that. We self-police really well. Mm. Um, if someone is an issue, it's more likely to be identified by people who say, I mean, you'll never be, you'll never see a place that takes safety around firearms more seriously than on a gun club. Like, yeah, you, you flag someone, you are off the range reported incident reports logged. Yeah. Like, but same time. So, I mean, we've recently been discussing around when we look at the new Arms Act and what could be brought in instead of the register, like how do we make New Zealand safer? What proactive things that we can do? Well, we could ask um, the police to follow the law. That, that might be a good start for public safety. 
that would definitely help as well as actually taking uh, taking the people who commit crimes using firearms off the streets and not allowing them to bleed down. But from a firearms community, so that we can be seen to be coming to the table with something fresh. Um, we know that pistol clubs have sort of compulsory membership to a club. Mandatory attendance, I don't like for every every owner of a firearms. But let's say we have the staggered licensing process in a similar way we have a beginner's restricted and full driver's licenses. If you're a new person, just 16 or whatever age you are, getting your firearms license for the first time, maybe you have to be a compulsory member of a club so that you can be around people who know how to use firearms safety, safely. They can imbue those in you and you can sort of get that culture of safety before you go off on your own. And then safety, later on. Safety briefings, attend safety courses, all of those sorts of things. Exactly. And the idea that you can get a firearms license in New Zealand through only reading a book and not setting any practical level, I think is a really interesting one. Imagine getting a driver's license, having only read the safe, the road code, but never driving a car. So I think that physical um, range handling, a very basic one, should be a compulsory part of getting a license. Yeah, because we talk if we talk about it from public safety point of view, right? We we have about six or seven hundred people die on our roads every year, right? It's mm -hmm. a road call. Well, we don't take people's cars off them. No, right? we don't. Oh. Um, we, if someone's an alcoholic, we take their car off them. Uh, or don't take the car off them. We take their license off them temporarily. Right? And if you're, if someone else goes speeding, we don't restrict V8 cars to say, you know what, nothing that goes over 100k an hour. Because why, why would you need a car that goes over 100 kilometers? The speed limit's 100. Yeah, but we've accepted that there is going to be a road toll. That there is a mm -hmm. risk to driving, and sometimes that risk involves death and injury. Yeah. But the police's default position with firearms is that we don't want any risk, and so they want to have heaps and heaps of restrictions so that you actually can't use your firearms at all, just about. And yeah. I'm pretty sure that the police don't actually want firearms in New Zealand at all. Having spoken to a couple of officers, um, some sworn and still serving others who have left the department for various reasons, there is more of an attitude that is, I mean, it'll be top down. It's hard to, it's hard to deny the changes in police attitudes since 2019. But then there's also issues like the Constable Hunt situation, like that fatal shooting of a police officer. It's yeah. understandable why they would not want the public or specifically criminals to be using guns because it puts their officers in danger. Completely understand that. But when it comes to licensed firearms owners who have passed all the safety tests and things, we're not the ones shooting at officers. No. Like we're not the ones who are putting them at risk. The fact that they are now fearful Zealand, of us. Small number. It's a very no, small number. The fact that they feel so afraid of us that they must come to our house armed and vested up is, I think, a real sad state of affairs around not only the, the licensed firearms owners' trust and confidence in police, but also in their own, like the fact that they view us in that way is it's not a good thing for society. Well, Hugh, we've come up against time now, so yeah. we've had a good traverse of a lot of the issues that many people out there who are thinking about uh, you know, obtaining a firearms licence or, or wanting to get interested in it will at least give them some thought about that and yeah. dispelled a few myths that are being put out in, in the rest of the media about firearms. So I really appreciate your time coming on the show. No, I appreciate it too. And I think despite the doom and gloom that we've got going on, there's, I think the final thing is, as we look at this Arms Act being put forward, the most important thing any of us can do now is actually make our submissions written or oral if you're comfortable when they ask for public consultation. Because yeah. we 100% know the gun control New Zealands and those who are anti-firearms will be out there in mass trying to change everything to make it more difficult for licensed firearms owners. And we need our community probably for the first time to come out in force and say, look, we want good gun laws that keep safe. But we need to actually write that. And for the first time, we have a government that's willing to listen to that process. The previous ones were very sort of, I mean, they were a bit of a joke, to be fair, their consultation. And so it's easy to be dismissive of the process. Now we actually need to back it because if we do this right over the next two years, we'll set ourselves up for success over the next 50. Yeah, and Reality Check Radio listeners know the power of submitting to particular bills. We've managed to get through a lot of changes, uh, you know, mm. most Im importantly around the COVID inquiry. But I would say that owning firearms and being able to hunt and gather food for yourself is actually a freedom issue. Yep. And and the more that the community embraces yeah. firearms and the more that they do this, the the better off it will be for everybody. Join clubs, 
participate in events and social events and everything else and and learn to to enjoy the benefits that come from firearms ownership. Yeah, like it's it's a great sport. It's a good way to feed your family as well. And we we need more hunters and shooters, especially young ones coming through. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you and look forward to it in future. You're welcome here on the show at any time. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, not everything you hear in legacy media from police or politicians about firearms is true or even honest. The firearms community, like the freedom community, has been victimized, denigrated, and maligned for far too long by both police and politicians. It's time we had sensible gun laws rather than emotional laws that have demonstrably failed. Tell me what you think about that discussion with Hugh Devereaux Mack. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.